afternoon. Dear colleagues, dear students, and dear guests, I am Dr. Nilufar Aminpour, and I have the honor to welcome you to the second Provost Round Table. The topic that is going to be discussed today is the future of Europe, the geopolitical and economic perspectives. Now, please let me to present our host and the present provost of our school, Professor Kriakos Kouvliotis. Professor Kouvliotis is the provost of the Berlin School of Business and Innovation, BSBI. He has a PhD in European Integration and International Relations awarded by Newcastle University, whereas he also holds an MA and diplomacy <coughs> awarded by Lancaster University UK, a certificate in linguistics awarded by Bangor University UK, and a BA in English literature and linguistics awarded by Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece. He has also completed two cycles of postdoctorate research, one on decision and policy making, and one on conflict resolution and crisis management. Professor Kovaliotis has worked in various research groups. He is an accomplished researcher in a variety of disciplines, and in the last 20 years, he has taught in many universities and educational organizations, globally among which Newcastle University, University of Sunderland, Derry College, University of Indianapolis, Hellenic Air Force War College, and Hellenic Naval War College, to name a few. He is an expert in developing new curricula, programs, syllabi, and also in building new global educational networks and partnerships, as he has already done with institutions from the US, UK, France, Italy, Switzerland, Ireland, also Singapore, India, and Somalia. Professor Kovaliotis has published 12 books and dozens of original scientific articles. His track record of academic publishing is composed of a variety of papers concerning political, economic, and educational issues. He has also served as a scientific advisor to the Minister of Defense, to the Deputy Minister of Development and Competitiveness, and to the General Secretariat of Communication and Mass Media of the Greek government. He has recently been appointed by the Minister of Education as a member in the governing committee of the Hellenic Open University. He also holds various professorships in institutions around the world as he is the honorary rector of the James Lind Institute and of the Rashford Business School in Geneva, Switzerland the Honorary Chancellor of Longford International College in Ireland, a professor at Uninantino University in Rome, Italy, and the president of Atenum Liberal Studies. Professor Kovaliotis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nilfa. Uh, I'm more than happy that uh, you presented uh, uh, the new topic that we will discuss in this Provost Roundtable. Um, before introducing uh, my colleagues, I have to stress that this is a very important and current discussion that we're going to have uh, and, and analyzing the future of Europe, especially in the current geopolitical and economic situation. Um, is something that applies to everybody, not only the students and our colleagues, but also to the general audience. Uh, I think we, as we did last time, discussing about the future of energy and what energy means and all the shortages and the crisis. Um, now there are 
very a significant number of very important geopolitical and economic changes that actually is a, are away from our doorsteps. So I think it's also our academic duty to focus on this. Now, um, let me introduce my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Funtis is a lecturer at BSBI and also the head of uh, our undergraduate studies. Dr. Flavio Andrew Donacimento Santos yes. uh, is also a colleague and a lecturer at the school. Uh, Dr. Palanivel Velmurugudan, yes. I'm not going to mention your middle name because I will murder it. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Also a dear colleague um, and a lecturer at the school. And Mustafa Gabala, um, another colleague, an expert on tourism. Uh, and with great uh, professional experience. Now, before starting the, the open discussion that we're going to have, uh, by definition, this title generates a kind of controversy, let's say. Um, and Europe is not as widely accepted as it used to be 20 or 30 years ago. And I'm talking about Europe in the whole, but also uh, mainly the European Union. So if you remember how this story started, uh, and for me it started as a revolution. In uh, 1951, just some years after the end of the Second World War, six of the founding members of the European community back then uh, France, Germany, Italy, and the three Benelux countries, as they are called, Holland, uh, Belgium, and Luxembourg, they united the industries of war. That was the steel and coal community. And that was the first integration organization that was created in Europe. So these nations used to be enemies just some years before. Uh, but no matter what they decided, in order to avoid a, a third world war or another war in the European continent and also to bring, to bring prosperity to their citizens, to unite the former industries of war, which is coal and steel. And this is how this journey to European integration started. And back then, because of that, uh, for me, it was a revolution at this age. But now, as all revolutions, uh, after some decades passed, uh, then they become sort of regimes. And now we are saying that in many of the cases, European Union does too little and too late. And it has been created probably like a big bureaucratic beast based on Bra in Brussels and in other cities that uh, most of the European institutions are based, and that it has alienated itself from uh, the citizens themselves. So, coming to what we need to discuss now. Dr. Fundis, can you provide an assessment, according to your opinion, of the current geopolitical and economic environment in Europe? I want at this stage to exclude anything that is uh, related to energy, because we covered this topic uh, in our previous meeting, and I want us to focus on what we call high and low politics. So, uh, thank you very much. When we are speaking about geopolitics in general, we cannot avoid uh, the maps. We cannot avoid geography. Uh, and uh, as I had the chance to work uh, over ten years and to live um, five years in uh, China in, or generally in uh, Asia. Uh, one thing that I hate very often is that all the maps that they are everywhere in, in our books, they use always Europe as the center. And you see the United States to the left side, and the Americas, and the Asia. So, and there are also people that they try to, to change this, because this so that we have practically a Europe-centric attitude very often in the politics, in what is happening. This is the one point. Uh, this about, let's say, the concepts and the notions that we have uh, around us. What is happening the last um, practically 30 years 
with the, especially after the entrance of uh, China uh, in the World Trade Organization 98, we started having all this development of uh, globalization. We started speaking about this geopolitics and having uh, unilateral uh, relations between the states, which of course was uh, a result of the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union back in the early 90s. And I'm going in this row because there was once a very ambiguous book that we still discuss and now we discuss it again. It was The End of History from Francis Fukuyama in 1992. Uh, and this wording only, the end of history, that now there is a new word, the liberal democracies, uh, the monetarization of values, uh, the liberalism will prevail. Uh, if somebody, uh, they have become prominent, if somebody reads the book, it has a different argumentation, but only the title itself, it was provocative. And for closing this introduction, for this uh, multipolar world we are moving forwards and uh, we see what is happening actually uh, with uh, Ukraine. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, one of the phrases that uh, created or it was something like a preamble of what is happening it was back in 2005 the phrase of um, President Putin that the biggest disaster of the 20th century it was the collapse of the Soviet Union and now we see this is getting somehow deployed uh, based on uh, different balances that they're getting created. Uh, I think uh, I would say somehow we are sure that, and to, to finish this introduction, it is the um, box of Pandora, as we call it, from the famous myth, it has opened. And now we are going to a restructuring. Okay, thank you. Comrade Tassos. Uh, Comrade. Uh, but to <laughs> to focus expensive. more on, on, on uh, practical things and to move away from the old discussion about Cold War and what happened, and because now we probably experience a new form of that. But the union itself are the citizens, right? So all of us. So that means the consumers or the business people. And in that sense, uh, Dr. Flavio, what European Union means today for the consumer and the, and the business people? Uh, what it means? Ben, um, well, from the start, we should start connecting with the previous speak that we change, we have a little bit of shape, a new shape of what is a consumer, of what European Union means for the consumer. So we, we start to see very much ourselves as way more as consumers and way less as um, citizens. And this is a very important shape for European Union in general, or at least how European Union sees us. So we can talk about how we see European Union or what this European Union means to us. In, our, in, in today's world, I would say for European Union, uh, sees us in, uh, from two big, um, I would say, divisions for first economic cooperation, which is the most popular one and the one that everybody knows about, the one that everybody comments about and everybody is happy about at the same time, because from a consumer point of view, to have a free trading, free trading in 27, 27 European countries, it's amazing as a consumer. But then, and the second part that most no one talks about, and we should also emphasize, uh, we should also request the European Union to protect the consumers, to um, um, pay attention to the consumer laws that we have towards these 27 European uh, countries. Also, the unfair marketing practice that now with social media we have a, a huge problem only with this topic and of course this leads to a lot of fraud and if we to connect with the beginning of my my sentence if we don't see ourselves as citizens first before we see ourselves as consumers we don't follow behind all of these um, features the, uh, the the big value of European Union for consumers and citizens great uh, a classic example of 
of what you mentioned, to, to be more practical, is the use of the same uh, electric plug uh, from uh, 2023, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and you know, th that seems like an insignificant detail, but it's not. Because if you see how many things and processes are attached to that, it also signifies how it is important to harmonize and standardize processes at the European level. And, and here I want to say something that for me is very important, especially for, for younger generations. Because I see what most of our students have to do in order to get their student visa and come here from different countries and all these processes. And all young people, including ourselves, uh, that we live, that we are fortunate enough to live within the European context, and uh, that we don't need anything to travel. As you said, it's free movement of people, capital, services, and everything else across the 27 uh, member state countries now. Um, most of our youngest generations or colleagues, they take this liberty or freedom for granted. Um, I know that I will now sound like I'm a bit older, but I still remember my first trip abroad that I had to go to Great Britain. They even stabbed my passport back then because I carried a photo camera and, and they want to make sure that they didn't buy it in the UK and then return back. And, and this is just a significant incident, of course, but uh, all these young people that they were born in the last 20 years or even 30 years and they are enjoying everything else that some other people they have to really fight and, and pay great attention to every little detail in order to manage to be here. And this is because the European Union has been developed into a regime as I told you, uh, which was inevitable because this is what is happening. But maybe the answer to all of these challenges is the Union to rediscover itself. And as I usually say to my students as well, the future of European integration is for the EU to make a step back in order to move two steps forward. And maximalistic aspirations like having a European constitution for me will never work. So we have to return to the basics of the old EEC and then come back. And then try to create new things and then try to, to make all these um, movements and all these ideas and policies more appealing to people. Um, and, and you need to understand that we are talking about multiculturalism and these consumers, as you notice, they belong to different countries and all of them they have to coexist together. And there is also this famous discussion that uh, lately that they say, is it again the Europe of nations the Europe of people, the Europe of alliances. So, my friend uh, Mustafa, what is the impact of multiculturalism and, in, and immigration in Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, before we talk about uh, the impact of multiculturalism in Europe, uh, let's uh, define the, the, the term uh, in the beginning, because multiculturalism uh, can be uh, understood uh, through debates or uh, political uh, debates uh, about how to uh, understand, how to respond to the cultural diversity in uh, society. Also, it can mean uh, that uh, the co-existence uh, of a diversity uh, culture, uh, which include essence, uh, religion, for example, and uh, any other uh, culture uh, group. About Europe, uh, actually, uh, there is uh, encouragement in Europe uh, for uh, multiculturalism through uh, the promoted, uh, many promoted integration uh, program uh, to collect people together, to uh, uh, let uh, people take that chance and opportunity to uh, express about themselves, uh, to uh, come uh, together. Uh, about the impact now, about the impact, of course, uh, there are uh, many uh, impact for uh, multiculturalism. Uh, can be seen uh, from uh, the recent uh, immigration uh, post, which called uh, Arabian 
uh, spring. Uh, many uh, countries uh, go for uh, changing uh, the regime and uh, in result uh, many uh, people leave their countries and move from their country to Europe and uh, we can take uh, Germany as an example. Uh, not only from Middle East, we can also uh, find uh, migrants from uh, Africa and from uh, India, uh, especially after this uh, IT field is opened uh, for them, for uh, individuals who are seeking to uh, uh, migrate and uh, have a, a, a job in Europe or uh, in Germany. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the main impact is the economic impact uh, because all of these travel, uh, travelers who move to uh, Germany, they are uh, contributing, actually a huge contribution to uh, economy uh, as they are uh, skilled people and accept work uh, with uh, low uh, wage. Uh, and also uh, filling uh, the labor uh, labor uh, shortage. Uh, in religion as well, we can find that uh, many survey, many uh, statistics telling that the number of the people who uh, already uh, change their religion or increase uh, uh, the, the, the religion uh, in, in Europe. Uh, also uh, for uh, uh, we said about economic, we said about uh, religion, we, population, uh, of course, uh, they have a big uh, and a huge impact. So it's, it's good that you mentioned the population, but mainly the economic aspect. And yeah. I want to ask Dr. Panar Level to um, somehow to share your opinion and comment on the financial sector and its prospects in Europe. Because uh, we discuss the historical context and multiculturalism and businesses and the consumer, but everything is in related, is related to uh, the financial aspect. And we should not forget that the whole European integration uh, venture started as an economic union. Of course, the Euro, the Eurozone, and the economic and monetary union that we have now, and that all these nations that they participate in, they take unanimous decision most of the times. Um, some say that we cannot proceed and go ahead without having also a political union, because you have the same currency for all the countries, and as I said, for fiscal policies they can decide together, or for assisting uh, some of the nations that they are in need, but at the same time, they all have different foreign policies and they have also different security policies. So you have the economic and monetary union all together, harmonized, but then you have the CFSP, as it is called, the common foreign security policy, different, exercised by each nation. So coming back to the financial sector, as an expert, okay, yeah. what are its prospects in Europe? Yeah, thank you, Professor. The financial sector is a major contribution to the European economy. So, compared with the world economy, the Europe economy is a major percentage. So, most of the investors are seeking their investment only for making the more money in the short term. So, they are interested to invest their money in the capital market. So, it is also contributing the major percentage for the Europe economy and the London Stock Exchange, you know, it is one of the major uh, stock exchange in the Europe. So in the capital marketing, most of the investors are see, uh, investing their money in the derivatives market. So we know only the cash market, so it is very minimal percentage. So most of them, they are investing their money in derivatives market. Then apart from that, uh, we may find uh, many bonds, sovereign bonds from the government sector. So the peoples are getting the minimal returns. They are not interested to carry the more risk. So moreover in the government bonds, uh, we are getting the return back our money 100% almost. 
So most of them are interested in the bond side as well as uh, not only in the capital market and uh, nowadays the investors are interested to invest their money in the alternative investment. In the alternative investment we may call it as the real estate. Now in Europe the residential real estate the property prices are getting very high mm. because of uh, the overvaluation, the monetary uh, mortgage benefit from the bank. The people are interested to invest their money in the alternative investment. Then apart from that, the banking sector. So banking sector is also one of the major contribution to the country economy. Uh, the recently, the banking are facing a lot of issues because of the inflation rate. So now the Europe zone, they have uh, recorded the inflation rate of 5.2 percentage. So because of this, uh, most of them are NPL. So you know the non-performing non loans. Apart from that, uh, most of them are, uh, most bankings are facing the capital adequacy ratio. So these are all the major issues the banks are facing from the investment side. Then the recent survey, if you are taking, uh, what is the best economical stable country in this world? So Switzerland followed by the Germany, Canada. So most of the countries from the Eurozone only. So in the financial sector, the most of the European countries are stable, but because of this COVID issues, there is some bottleneck supply chain. So apart from this bottleneck supply chain, uh, there is an interest rate, the Central European, uh, European Central Bank, they are increased the interest rate because of they want to control the inflation. So this is the major challenges the financial sector they have. Let's hope that this will be temporary. Uh, as you know, maybe this is the aftermath of the COVID crisis, but uh, this is maybe this is also the beginning of a new global crisis. We don't know. Um, thanks for your comments. Uh, personally, I didn't have the chance yet to invest in the London Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. I hope I will in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but it, it, it's very important what you mentioned um also about harmonization of all this and i have to return to to flavio and ask should europe adopt then more common policies and try to harmonize the processes uh, and as we said before to standardize it across all members uh, or should we leave uh, each member state to have their own policies and more kind of freedom. I have to remind you that that was one of the cases uh, that pushed Great Britain to be against, let's say, uh, having a future within the EU. But on the other hand, I want to connect this to what you said before. For the consumer, maybe this is something positive and they want to see harmonized policies and same policies across, uh, across countries. So what's your opinion on this? From the consumer point of view, it's actually very good that we can have the same policies all over these countries, as I mentioned before. And it's great to have more integration, more common policies, because from the consumer perspective of our mindset, or our minds doesn't work very much, or we don't like very much, our minds doesn't like very much, if we have a lot of options, a lot of rules, a lot of... Um, laws, a lot of financial um, perspectives, uh, bank work in this, this way here in, in, in Germany, works in a different way in France, which is very close here. So from the consumer perspective, it's uh, um, evidently very good that we have the same policy for all the countries. Although I highly, uh, I need to connect with the first sentence you said, the, the problem, we faced a lot of problems to have the same uh, rule applying for all the countries, which is respect the local realities. We should not also um, believe or start from the point that all business they should be done in the same way in all 27 countries, which means um, we should respect the local um, realities. We should also respect the markets itself because maybe it's nice to have, for example, tourism in tourism, the same law applying for all the 27 countries. But maybe it's not so nice to have banking uh, applying 27 rules, sorry, applying all the rules for the 27 countries. <coughs> so we go to this idea of regime, 
that you mentioned in the beginning, and I'm using your own words. <laughs> and yeah, we, we should not have this no notion of regime and impose to all the 27 countries uh, the agenda, what the own document of the new consumer agenda from the European Union, which is fantastic because, as I mentioned before, it has a lot of consumer pr protection and should um, protect the consumer, especially now after COVID, for example. And I, you mentioned the example of the electricity plugs. I can also, see, we can also just mention the example of COVID-19 and traveling because you see every country with uh, its own rule and then in just to travel within the European Union, which is another thing, the European Union, Schengen space in Eurozone, right? We should make this difference, which is already for consumer perspective, okay. We should learn something before just traveling in freedom and go around the countries. And it's another very, layer... It's very interesting what you mentioned because uh, immediately after the lifting of the restrictions on COVID, uh, people were so anxious to travel again. Uh, and that, that brings me to you, Mustafa, again. So... Mm tourism yeah. and the exchange of, of populations mm -hmm. for, uh, for a pleasure or for business trips or, uh, because that is in the core of the creation of the union, the free awesome. movement. Yeah. What does it mean now? Is it the same as it used to be some years ago before COVID or 10 years ago? Now we have the euro, the same currency. We can even go to France or we go to the Netherlands with the same card and, you know, you have this kind of flexibility. Yeah. So you are an expert in tourism. So what does it mean? What, what tourism means for Europe now? Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, actually, uh, tourism means uh, a lot, uh, not only for Europe, but for all uh, the destination, the tourist uh, destination. And since long time, we consider uh, Europe as a world lead number one uh, tourist uh, destination. Uh, for example, in 2013, uh, France, uh, Italy, uh, Spain, uh, the United Kingdom, and uh, of course Germany were among the world lead top 10 uh, tourist uh, destination for holiday uh, makers. In a result, this uh, industry became a key sector for whole the European uh, Union. And because of uh, this importance, uh, the European uh, Union uh, aims to uh, promote uh, tourism in, uh, in Europe uh, in order to uh, maintain, uh, uh, in order uh, to maintain the region uh, positions uh, as a leading uh, destination and also maximize the industry uh, contribution to growth and uh, employment. If we have a look to uh, the main component for uh, tourism, for example, uh, starting from uh, supply chain and uh, the, the tourism uh, core uh, surface and the functional uh, surface, we'll understand well why all government now uh, and recently uh, giving big attention to this sector because uh, in simple way, uh, all the other industry are benefit from this uh, industry. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, there, is, uh, there are many impact uh, for economic impact and environmental uh, impact and health uh, as well. Uh, uh, tourism, uh, uh, the, the, the main contribution of uh, the total GDP, European uh, GDP, so uh, huge contribution to the economy and uh, also has many positive impact for environmental health as well. And since you mentioned the GDP um, and, and the contribution of tourism, something that maybe not a lot of people know, actually two things. The one is that the European Union is the biggest market in the world. And the second, it's the biggest humanitarian provider in the world as well. This is very important. Mm -hmm. But to provide all this and to have the circulation of goods and of products and everything, you need to have this established European Union. And Dr. Palanivel 
do you think that the adoption of the euro, the common currency we're having, and the application of the European Monetary Union that I mentioned before, help national economies to grow? Or at the same time, because let's say we cannot print currencies, it's a constraint. It brings stability, but it also doesn't allow flexibility. What is the truth? Thank you, Professor. So Euro introduced in the financial market in the year 1919. So from the 1919, uh, some of them are uh, joined at the beginning. Then after that, some other countries are included. They are using uh, Euro currency. So there are many benefits whenever we are using the common currency in the Europe. So if you are doing the business, it will be helpful to open the market widely. So no, there is no transaction cost whenever we are doing the import and export. So because of this, uh, many of the business people are interested to do more import and export. So at the time of we are exchanging from one country currency to another country currency, so we are paying a lot. So if you are considering so one euro, it is a very small, meager amount. So if you are considering the billions of euros, so the transaction cost is very high. In the meantime, there is there some disadvantages. So there is some rigid policy, what you said. So all the, for example, European Central Bank, they are raising the interest rate. Commonly, they are raising the interest rate. So some of the countries comes under the developed country like Germany. So some of them are not that much of developed. So that country is also not affordable for that much of interest rate. So this is one of the major disadvantage I am seeing if they are using common currencies. So definitely the euro currency we are commonly using entire the euro. So it is advantage. So other than the euro country, some other countries are also accepting the euro currency other than the euro region. So when if the euro is collapsed, it is not possible. So if it's euro is collapsed, all other countries are we started their own national currencies. Thanks, Andres. Uh, Dr. Fundis, some um, politicians, even scholars, they claim that all this is plan of Germany to dominate the economic Europe. sphere mm -hmm. and try to manage in that way what they didn't manage the other means. And although this whole uh, journey started with the so-called Franco-German action, that is the alliance between France and Germany. Now it's very German dominated. And especially countries in, in the south, like in the Mediterranean, um, they feel somehow that they are confined and that they have to follow usually what the German directives are and they have somehow put Europe and the future of Europe together with what Germany has in mind. Uh, and if you add to this the current geopolitical challenges that we have uh, and the war, which is actually on a next step, and, and, and all this turmoil in our neighborhood, for your opinion, what should be the role of the EU and of NATO currently in this current situation. And, and I mean, when I say current, I mean probably in the next decade. Um, is it going to be like the Americans of NATO will play something like an international police force? Should the EU only strengthen and stay on the economic aspect? Who is going to pay, for example, the extra money that are required for the EU to develop its own army or its own foreign security policy and say, okay, we don't need NATO anymore? Or should these two work together as a security branch or as an economic branch? So what is your opinion? <coughs> the ones that they support this idea, which is um, practically what is happening very often in Europe, is that there is a German economically dominated policy about having rigid measures and playing, as you mentioned before, uh, with the exchange rates are the same ones when Germany is not moving, 
like the case now with Ukraine, that they blame them. So there is always a problem because Germany has identified itself as a soft power. And this was one of the um, problems uh, that they still exist in Germany about uh, having a bigger army. Huh? And uh, there was this famous statement, the 27th of February. Although the stance of Germany in the European fora is not uh, at all soft. Sometimes. I said, this is how they define themselves. So we have, you have this, this, uh, this um, discrepancy somehow. You can, of course, disagree. Uh, nobody hears us. So. <laughs> 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 no, no. The, 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 I, I see this problem. It goes back um, in the late 80s. Uh, and because we had the chance at this time, this is now I'm coming also disagreeing, as I'm saying. I think the political solution. Uh, that would help to integrate. Uh, we have integration in uh, uh, the electric uh, plugs. We have a, why we cannot have an integration of social security number. We have huge companies like SAP that, for example, that they could integrate all the so social security numbers of the 500 million of uh, people. So we need a willingness to move forward uh, towards an identity. And what I mean by that, when I was living in, uh, when I'm in the States or when I was living in China, when I was uh, saying I'm coming from, G from Greece, I'm living in Germany, ah, you are European. Huh? So we have much more common things than we think, but because of our strong identities, we are focusing always on the different aspects that we have, like different languages, different, uh, the Latino, uh, the Anglo-Saxon tradition, the Nordic tradition, the uh, South and the Mediterranean tradition, of course they coexist. This is what makes uh, Europe, as you said before, uh, I think so the, powerful. I think the, the problem starts, and there are some countries, even when they join the EU, and they say, the citizens, now you will become Europeans. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. They were Europeans already. So right. you cannot draw a line like this. Exactly. Uh, 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 and, and remember, when there were just six countries, and now there are 27, this is called, because gradually more countries were added, this is called the enlargement process, or otherwise the widening process. So it goes like this. At the same time, there is another process, which is called deepening. And it goes like this. So you have two axes. Now, what is the deepening? Is when you have institutions, like the European Parliament, which is the parliament of all European citizens, let's say, you have the Council of Ministers yeah. per task or per ministry. Then you have the European Council, which is the heads of states and governments. Uh, and of course, the European Court of Justice. The more power you put into this institution, the more deepening this process is. But you cannot have both. You cannot increase the number of states and strengthen the institution. They, does, they don't meet. So you either have to increase the number or strengthen the organization itself from the inside. But not together or not at the same time. Or maybe you should first accept new members and then pause and say, okay, now let's strengthen the European Parliament and do this harmonization of legislation. And let's have all common European plates in the cars or common VAT or, you know, all these policies. Um, but it's not always easy and you cannot have at the same time, as I said. Um, and at the end of the day, is up to the politicians and those that they decide on these policies what they want to do. And citizens now, they feel that they're alienated from the center of decision making. It's not like, like before. And who is listening and what they're going to do and what European elections means now, it's not the same as it used to be in the past. And don't forget that by giving to the European institutions some powers, like the Euro, for example, or you give some extra power to the European Court of Justice because EU directors and legislation, in many of the cases, are above national legislation, but this comes with a price. When you give this extra power, you take something from your own people and from your own country. And this is called the spillover effect in, in, in European politics. So you give something and you take something in return. But this is how it is. So I'm going to ask you 
the last question and come around of discussion, which I think has to be common for all. And this is what do you think should be for all of us, for the students, for business people, for the consumer, even for the neighboring countries, uh, taking into consideration all the challenges we have discussed. What will be the future of Europe? How it's going, this political or geopolitical or economic situation is going to be developed in the next 10 years? What we should expect? Um, those of us that we have young kids, in which Europe they will start seeking employment or to study or, or to establish a career? Who wants to comment first? You, Dr. Yeah. Van Aneva. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Bruce. So, the future of Europe, uh, as per the economist predicted, uh, the size of the GDP in the 2025, so they mentioned 458 billion euros. In 2030, it is a 850 billion euros. So definitely the future of Europe will increase day by day. So recently we are facing some crisis. So very soon the Europe countries are recovered from this situation. Then apart from that, all the Europe countries, they want to develop their social and solidarity economy. That is very, very important. So in the future, uh, in my point of view, so it is a stronger economy. The second one is a social justice. The third one is a good labor market. Then fourth one is a less unemployment rate. Finally, so the European country has good high living index. So this is what the future of the Europe from my point of view. Okay. <clears throat> I will continue from NATO that we did not discuss before because this has become active. Uh, President Macron two years ago uh, had uh, said something like that NATO has no brain or does not exist. And uh, we should not remember that this has been created because of the situation of the Second World War. Uh, one thing that uh, now I have to refer to, and it's just, uh, just in one case, an aphorism that exists in the last period is that many people say the Europeans sold their energy to Russia and, uh, or the Soviet Union before and their security to the Americans, uh, to the United States. So uh, what we need, it is to have, to, to think more politically. This is what I started saying before, because we need also eventually, not immediately, this constitution. We are Europeans, as you mentioned, already by identity. So the question is to, to bring these things forward. Okay, the economic part sounds good. We are getting older. We have a controlled migration. Uh, we follow a, something like the model of the United States with the pros and cons. Uh, but the reality is uh, that it is not important to be only a, a big power. We are a big market uh, economically, uh, but Practically, we cannot impose the values that we are representing because at the end of the day, what makes Europe unique are these democratic values, are the ways that we are living. And actually, with the current situation of what is happening, we have a denial of this. And we're having a debate about strong leadership against the soft power that the Europeans have. It's a bigger discussion. What, what I want from you to comment, since you, yeah. you follow that route. Yeah. Are we or should we be the United States of Europe or a business club? The United States of Europe, because this is... This, this is not is the easy, because people are trying and discussing this for the last 50 years. Yeah, we're discussing this, but... United but States of Europe means... You are having the integration... You have this for everything. So We have this already on the passport, but... but we have to see the, the, what is happening practically, and this is, that's why the situation in Ukraine created practically some reflective um, reaction from many people, because let's remember uh, August 1914, uh, Austria-Hungary against Serbia. Uh, uh, 1st of September 1939, what is happening? You have the big power, which is practically uh, the German Reich at this moment, uh, attacking Poland. With all the, I'm not going yeah, to do the details right for a second. So, now you have Ursula von der Leyen, yeah. that if she is the head, or, well, she is actually, yeah. the head of the European Commission, has to go to some small villages in Portugal, 
and convince them that the harmonization of policies and the initiation of new common policies have to be directed by her and her cabinet. Like, that's, let's that's say, having the commissioners, like they are European ministers. So you have one minister for education for all the members. This is what Europe, uh, um, United European, States of Europe means. I don't think many of the people, they are willing to accept some commissioners or some public servants in the EU that are appointed and not elected also because of the balance of power that there is within the, uh, the European member states. And of course you understand that, let's say, weak or not so big states, the portfolios in the commission that they receive, it's not about foreign policy or economic integration, it's about fisheries and sometimes immigration and some mm -hmm. other things. So it's not easy. And, so, and I don't see how we can have a route without calculating the economic but also the political aspect. And for me, before we discuss about further unification and bring all the states together as in the United States, we need to solve if we want more or less. More integration or less? More power to the member states? Or we even gave our flags away and have all the other documents and everything and we adopt this. Um, and by the way, don't forget that in the beginning it exactly. was to avoid war, bring prosperity and raise the European GDP. But now it's an organization that we don't know where it goes because it's the character is not clear as it used to be. But on the other hand, the challenges are more. Many, many more. So not, we, are not, we, are not, we are not we are not prepared for this. That's why they, what they they GDPR, say. for example. That yeah. was the, yeah. the flag yeah. of all the, I yeah. think for me it created more problems than those that they saw. Okay? okay. And and actually how many of these policies are actually exercised? Um, the, the problem so as is a to, to, have, to, to, have, to, have, to have more transfer uh, and more direct democracy. So this is also the, 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 the problem that we have already in the European Union with the, um, with the European Parliament that somehow represents what is happening and the European Commission. So this is the, the place where the reloading should take place because we cannot continue for this with the, under this perspective. And we, we need a common vision. That's why I think if this will not be successful, then everybody will go its own way. As you mentioned, or what we said, Germany is somehow more robust. Uh, they will uh, follow some uh, policies. The smaller ones that they will start uh, saying, OK, let's see what the big ones are doing. Uh, I, I think it, 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 the system needs a reloading. We have a problem there. And uh, I'm not speaking for this aggressivity that some people they show to the institution itself, but uh, we need a transfer of power uh, back more to the people for a certain period and then to see how this thing is, is you, happening. You mentioned the people and I think we are a little bit unlucky because we live in an era that there are no leaders anymore. Mm. And if you think those Jean Monnet or Adenauer that, uh, that created this union many years ago, and all the other uh, political leaders, but also economic leaders. Now we live in the era that there is a scarcity and there is a lack of all these big personalities. And for this, we're a little bit unlucky. Uh, and if we wait for the French president, Emmanuel Macron, or from Scholz, Scholz the, I mean, these people, if, if you put them together with the other, the old politicians that we had 10 or uh, 15 or 20, 25 years ago, mm. uh, you can see there is a deficit, okay? Um, but I don't mean we don't like them, but, but uh, people like Mitterrand, for example, or people like Prondi, they're, they're missed. Mm. And we really want these personalities to, to drive the other people. So, Dr. Flavio, for you, what should be the future of Europe? Well, I... When I was guy, you guys were talking, I was reflecting about this here. And there are two answers for this question. The way I think as an expert or talking with science and 
what research is showing to us, especially in economic terms, what should be the future of Europe, and what is the reality, as you said very well. And <coughs> we, sh we should not mention that recently, we, we should not forget to mention, I'm sorry, that recently we had elections in Italy and they are very, with a very strong opinion against the European Union. The same uh, a little bit before in France. So, and we have the power, we cannot talk about the future of Europe without mentioning China, without mentioning USA, NATO, and Russia. So the reality is a bit um, dangerous, or as you said, um, it's a bit complicated and we have no references, nobody is doing this anywhere in the world, so we can, uh, we can discuss or we can see how it's going on in the, in the other part of the planet. So we need to think about ourselves and all, with our own experience, the future of Europe. So it's, in reality, it's a bit complicated to answer. And, uh, and I think it's way, way more challenging in terms of politics because the rise of this far right, especially, uh, programs, I would say, a good word for this, uh, power right programs, they are rising in Europe, super nationalists and super against European Union. And I would say, in my opinion, more integration, more connections should be the future of Europe, which is exactly the other uh, direction of what's going on. So, um, but there, we're going to this trap that we're having this discussion here right now which is, uh, but if we go with more integration, with more countries, should we impose the rules to them and then we are strong enough or we should just be a soft leader or no, just as a title, as a soft leader? So the, the idea is there, but to get there is the, cha is the challenge. And in my opinion, we should have more integration if we look forward to this. It's interesting what you mentioned and I think also the answer is for all, uh, all of us that are European citizens to look on ourselves uh, and it's also interesting what you mentioned about the elections in Italy and maybe we should have another session just because of the political parameters and, and, and everything but you have noticed that the whole dilemma there was what we mentioned before return to the nation state less power to European organization let their own country decide of what is going to happen <coughs> we don't need so much immigration anymore, but at the same time, when you have olive, olive trees and you want to collect the olives, local people do not go, as I personally know. Uh, so, you see, you cannot have everything. That's why I said we should look on ourselves first, look on the mirror, uh, and then decide what we want. Because the politicians that we are having now, and this deficit that we commented, is what we probably deserve. This is how it goes. And most of these uh, generations that are uh, now ready to come and, and work in Europe and have a career and study, and uh, they will not have all this tradition and all this background from their parents because they will not be there anymore. And they have to operate in what they know now. And at least there are some old people that they know what Europe used to be in the past and all this great progress that uh, we have made and, and all these new policies that we have adopted. And I want to end with you, uh, Mustafa, because you come from Egypt, uh, a country outside uh, the European Union and, and from the European continent. Um, so for you, as let's say somebody that visited Europe and studied here and have a career and teach other people, what do you think will be the future of Europe? The future of Europe? Actually, this is a very tough uh, question because we are talking about future of a specific continent, not even a country. Uh, Europe has many uh, countries and each country has different uh, politic, uh, political uh, situation, economic situation, and all uh, uh, the situations are different from one to one. Uh, all what I need, uh, actually there is nothing to be added after uh, the professor already uh, do, uh, but what I need from uh, or hope from uh, the European uh, leader 
to sit together to solve the problem, to work, to keep Europe as uh, strong as it is now and to be like, uh, like before. Uh, all the, uh, the current situation is telling a lot of things. We don't want to uh, go through all of this uh, issue, but what we hope to solve this problem to avoid any other uh, third world war or uh, any other uh, things could uh, affect the future of Europe. Thank You're you. right. Thanks very much. Thank First you. of all, thanks all of you for uh, participating here today. I think what we actually did is to open a window for personal reflection and for uh, maybe remind everybody to come back to the basics uh, because we forget fast. Um, and I want to thank our audience as well and hope to see you all very soon at the next Provost Roundtable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.